All right, good evening, everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started. My name is Spencer Cronin, and I am the program coordinator here at the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. And I'd like to welcome you all to this installment of our History Highlight Series, which is gonna look at unusual artifacts in our archival collections. So before I welcome Felicia Williamson, our Director of Library and Archives, who's gonna host this program, um, I just wanna take a quick second to thank all of our community partners for this event, the Dallas Jewish Historical Society, George W. Bush Presidential Center, Legacy Senior Communities, SMU Human Rights Program, Southwest Jewish Congress, and the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission. We really appreciate your support. We are gonna have time for Q&A at the end of the program where we'll also be joined by Dr. Sarah Abosh, our Chief Education Programs and Exhibitions Officer. Um, so if you wanna go ahead and locate that little Q&A button, it'll probably be at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you're on a computer, it might be at the top if you're on a tablet or a phone. Um, so submit questions there throughout the program and we'll be sure to get to those at the end. Um, so with that, I'd like to bring up Felicia. Hi everybody, my name is Felicia Williamson. I'm the Director of Library and Archives. Um, for those of you who join these programs hoping to see my cat in the background, I'm, ha I'm happy to share that she's with us today. Um, this evening we're going to talk about some of the most unusual artifacts in our collection. It's pretty exciting to get to spend some time with the collection and find artifacts that I had maybe seen before but hadn't spent time really exploring and to be able to share those with you. So with that, I'm going to share my screen and share my PowerPoint and we'll get started. Okay, so for those of you who saw a little video on social media advertising for this event, one artifact that we wanted to be sure to share with you is very unusual. It's an SS uniform catalog published by the SS, by the Nazis in 1940. Um, it's pretty exciting because I've only found one other example of this uniform catalog in a library in the world, and it's in the um, the Army, the University of the Armed Forces in Munich, Germany. And it just so happens that a GI um, picked one up, uh, inscribed it in 1945, and brought it home and ended up donating it to us. So we're very um, glad to have it and be able to share with you. It's it's uh, pretty astonishing when you get to look at it. So we're going to look at quite a few pages, not all, but it's about 20 pages long. So here we go. So this is, uh, of course, it's a SS catalog, so it's in German, but it's a, this says priceless for SS troops, um, November 1940. It was picked up in 1945. Here's the table of contents, and you see there's all kinds of uniform components, hats, um, there's even luggage, leatherware, leather goods, um, gloves, um, and then um, sport beclighting, so things that you would use to go work out, I guess. <laughs> um, so when we see, when we think of SS, this image certainly rings true to me. Everything I think of as an imposing um, fear, um, fearful image, this SS uniform really has it all, including the Totenkopfa, the, the skull and crossbones. Um, and the thing that's so remarkable to me is this is such a regular part of this, of a SS individual's life that he would have a catalog, not unlike a Sears catalog, that he would order whatever uniform components he wanted. Um, and that see, it just makes the bizarre and otherworldly seem very commonplace and normal, which is in a way its own strange scenario. Here's another image of a very Aryan looking SS guy. And this is his field or his, um, his daily use fatigues. This I would not really seen before, nor ha had I imagined that they would have a special SS uniform for formal occasions. 
Um, but of course it makes sense when you think about it, but it's not an image that I had seen really before. Then of course the under things for the, your everyday SS gentleman, pajamas, collar stays, the whole nine yards. Um, there's a, a couple of other pages that I didn't include. One has some luggage and then another has like spurs, leather goods and so on and so forth. Pretty interesting stuff. And it of course has prices and, and there's a there's a, a insert at the end that tells you how to measure yourself to order the right size. So just a regular catalog, but for SS. Um, in related news, there's a very special set of, of artifacts in, in the vault that are actually made out of recycled Nazi flags. Took us a little bit to figure that out, but these are hand handmade, hand embroidered, carefully crafted um, handkerchiefs. And then there's also a pillowcase. And just remarkably, this was made out of a Nazi flag that was cut apart and, and repurposed. And you know that tells us a lot about post-war Nazi Germany. Um, of course, when you think about it, uh, there was rationing. Um, even Queen Elizabeth had to use rationing coupons to get her wedding dress. So that was going on for years and years after the war. And so uh, all these flags that all, were all of a sudden um, not required <laughs> for public use would have been valuable just for their clothing and reuse purposes. So it's kind of interesting that we ended up with some of those repurposed Nazi flag items. I'm gonna take a moment to, to talk about um, a liberator in our, uh, who has some really interesting artifacts in our collection. Uh, for those of you who attended uh, a book talk that Sarah and I gave a week or two ago about Sons and Soldiers, one of the um, Richie boys uh, who was featured in that talk, his name is Rudy Baum and he was, someone who worked with the museum for years and years and donated several collections. And he was an avid propaganda collector. And of course, propaganda images are always unusual, um, especially to our eyes. They often have some pretty stark imagery. That's how they convey their propaganda message. Um, so I wanted to share a few of the examples. We actually have hundreds of pamphlets and leaflets that Rudy Baum collected during his time as a Ritchie boy. Um, and for those of you who weren't at that book talk, Ritchie boys uh, were often Jew Jewish men uh, from Germany or Austria who were recruited, who joined the army once they immigrated to the United States and were recruited for counterintelligence and for interviewing and interrogating prisoners. And Rudy Baum was part of that effort and became pretty obsessed with propaganda um, to our benefit. So here is a picture, a very sweet picture of Rudy standing in our old museum, pointing at a picture of himself as he works with his unit to liberate Buchenwald. Um, and of course, you know, you liberators did all kinds of things, but US forces were integral in liberating several important camps like Buchenwald and Dachau. Um, and it's just a remarkable thing that his, he was able to see his own image in the museum across the street. Um, Rudy's mother was murdered in Ludge and he doesn't know what happened to his father. So this was a deeply personal thing for him too. Um, for the first pamphlet I wanted to show you guys, um, you know, propaganda was being used by all sides um, into all sorts of ends. So there was propaganda coming from the US targeting Germans. There was, there was Russian propaganda. There was, of course, German propaganda, all trying to educate, sway, uh, manipulate, and inform the public. Excuse me. And so this, this one says, Drive your kind Reich, das große Fragezeichen, 
Um, and it's trying to say that, hey, for those of you, this is US propaganda against the, or targeting the, the German population. It's trying to weaken those for whom the cult of Hitler was still effective and saying, hey, Hitler's not running this show anymore. The war is coming to the end. Do you know where he is? What's he doing? He's not running this show. Don't let your allegiance to Hitler inform your decisions about how to deal with Germany falling. Um, and so in this example, they're using the image of Himmler really being in charge and subjugating Hitler and stomping on Germany, the German homeland, as a way to push the US, I mean, I'm sorry, the German population to um, surrender peacefully. And of course, through the lens of history, we know that the German propaganda was pushing in the other direction saying, don't surrender, you know, you'll, you'll be mistreated, you'll suffer horrible consequences, do whatever you do to not surrender. So it's a war of information. This is, I mean, there's no way we couldn't select this image to share with you. It's pretty gruesome. And so this is a German piece of propaganda put out um, in cooperation with other Nazi propaganda organizations saying that Russia is coming for you. And so you better watch out. And of course, this multi-armed demon is, it has, has the head of Stalin at the top. It's a pretty intense image, um, certainly speaks for itself. This, this has some pretty interesting phrases in German. I'm gonna see if I can, um, just one second. Without reading word for word, down here at this, in the middle, it says, Die Partei und die SS sind bereit, den letzten deutschen Soldaten, den letzten Schuljungen, der nur ein Gewehr tragen kann, zu opfern. The whole message of this leaflet, obviously, rather than using a lot of images, this is a wordy one, is saying that the, the Nazi party and the SS are prepared to sacrifice every single person in Germany for their aims and that it won't do any good. Um, and in, in German here, it says, even to the last young school child, um, they will sacrifice everyone and it won't matter. So again, this is trying to convince the German population to peacefully surrender. Um, and it's asking the question here at the top, it says, you know, what, what's gonna happen after, after the peace is declared? What comes next? Think about it. And then this, this, this phrase caught my attention. Um, Den der Weiß, den er Weiß, das selbst die Weißblutung der Wehrmacht die Heimat nicht retten kann. So it says the Weißblutung, which means you bleed so much that your skin is white. You've bled all you can bleed, the, and it still won't save the homeland. Um, so it's pretty, pretty impactful wording and of course when you think in terms of the Ritchie boys they were participating in creating and distributing this um, counterintelligence and propaganda. This is a pretty interesting piece of Nazi propaganda. Um, it's obviously in French and it's anti-Semitic propaganda and uh, I, I had a hard time getting the image in here so you could understand what it is but it's basically has the appearance of a United States dollar bill. And then when you open it, it has a Star of David and it's saying essentially, um, if you wanna know who caused this war, it's the Jews. So still hitting home these really gruesome um, anti-Semitic tropes in the midst of a war that the Germans are losing. Now to take another tack, I wanna talk about a collection I hadn't really spent any time with, but it was really interesting. This gentleman, George Washington Seaman, um, was a, a liberator. He flew in, in um, the air squadron from 43 to 45, very dangerous work. Amazing to me how young he is. Um, golly, he just looks like he, he might be 19 or 20, and he probably was. 
Um, and he donated an artifact collection, had a couple of cool artifacts I want to share with you. This is his straight edge razor, which certainly seems to me like you could use it as a weapon. <laughs> um, and then the other one, this is a little plastic bottle of German skin salve used to treat chemical weapon burns. Um, so, I mean, what does this tell us? It's a tiny little object picked up um, as this GI was in Europe, and it tells us that the Germans were preparing the soldiers for an allied use of chemical warfare. So that's an interesting little tidbit. Um, and, and relating to health, there's two further objects I wanted to share with you that are pretty interesting. Um, the first, uh, the donor of this object used the word dagger, so a Nazi dagger. And when I, so that's what I was expecting. There's quite a few different kinds of Nazi weapons that, um, that GIs picked up and prized. Um, but I'd never seen anything like this before. So when the donor brought this out, I was pretty astonished because this is a, is a field medics bone saw. And it is, it has both the Nazi emblem and the red cross emblem on it. And it took a lot of digging to figure out what in the world's going on here. But essentially the SS operates as part of, or at, as almost like an agency in a national government. So, you know, we have the United States Red Cross. There's the French Red Cross. Um, and of course, in Germany, there was the Nazi German Red Cross. And so this was a bone saw and we think it was used during the war. Um, it's very worn, it has a lot of wear and tear um, to amputate limbs. And it's uh, a pretty astonishing artifact in a lot of ways. Interestingly enough, the Red Cross does have a pretty problematic history surrounding their, um, their record during uh, the Nazi period. Of course, they participated in covering up or with their knowledge, um, helping the Nazis hide their activities, especially in, in Theresienstadt or Theresien. Now, this is another health-related artifact. Um, this is from the Minor Schneider collection. Um, and essentially, it says, beat the axis, take a prophylaxis. So we're talking about preventing STDs. Um, you know, there's a trope about GIs surviving um, life in the theater by having clean socks and um, contraceptives. Um, interestingly enough, in the inside of this pamphlet, there's a uh, location guide to where you can find contraceptives. Um, there's some pretty gruesome imagery about how they're defining the axis, some caricatures there. Um, but I thought this was pretty interesting that someone liked this and found it memorable enough to save it. Um, and I'm glad they did. This, uh, I wanted to share one of the most um, touching artifacts I've seen, and significantly one of the most uh, endangered artifacts that we have in the collection. So this is a sign that was a, hung around um, an individual's neck while they're being transported to a concentration camp. So the sign is extremely fragile. As you can see, it's very faded. We have a very high, re uh, high resolution scan of the image, which I'm sharing with you here. Um, and this sign belonged to Amelie Marx, who was born in 1868. So she was deported in 1942 to Theresienstadt um, and was quickly murdered there or died there. Um, I did find her death certificate and it was almost immediately after arriving in Theresienstadt. Um, and so I just wanted to share this as, you know, a record of the victim. I had a really interesting conversation today with um, the assistant archivist who works with me at the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum because we were talking about how frustrating it is that there seems to be more evidence and understanding and research of the material culture surrounding the perpetrators. 
when we're researching artifacts, we can find more information about Nazi paraphernalia than we can find evidence of and artifacts depicting the lives of victims of Nazi perpetrators. And so when we do find that firsthand evidence and material culture documenting the lives of victims, it's just that much more meaningful and that much harder to research in some ways, because of course, in many ways, many examples, they're not able to speak for themselves and tell you about their own history. Sometimes they are, and that's amazing and great. We have some materials from survivors where they told us a lot about those materials. And sometimes that person was deceased and murdered. So it's an interesting conundrum. And just another document in the document trail for Amelie. So here is her transport card from Darmstadt to Theresienstadt. Um, interestingly enough, for, for those of you who know, the Nazis assigned Jews, uh, female Jews, a middle name of Sarah, and male Jews, the middle name of Israel, as a way to make sure to reinforce that this person was Jewish. And so this um, woman was given the middle name Sarah, and you can see it written right there. We take a moment to talk about a few artifacts documenting anti-Semitism in popular culture. Um, anti-Semitism is a, is a tricky topic because I think Europeans understand anti-Semitic imagery in a more direct way than sometimes we do in an American cultural context. Um, but I want to show you a couple of examples we have in our collection. Um, this is actually a replica of a door knocker that was created by the Nazis for a public building in Lauf, which is outside of Nuremberg. And there were two that, of these that were produced. One was put in Lauf and one was put in Nuremberg. Um, and of course, as you can see, it's a door knocker for a big wooden door where you lower the hammer on the, the stereotypical image of a Jew and you knock his nose. And I mean, to me, this tells me a couple of things. First of all, what a bunch of effort to reinforce a negative stereotype of a Jew. It doesn't make sense to me, but I'm glad it doesn't. Um, when our education team was in Europe, we were always trying to be on the lookout and, and we purposely sought out evidence of anti-Semitism in public buildings and imagery. And we found examples of that. And to a, to a European audience, a lot of these images would have been secondhand. They would have understood them right away. This is another example in our collection. This is actually a recent acquisition. Um, it's an anti-Semitic postcard that was sent in the 1930s. Um, so it has a stereotypical Jewish man here. Um, some sort of way of saying believe me without with the wrong um, phrasing and this was sent you know as a matter of course no big deal. Um, another unusual artifact in our collection this uh, this is a crematoria label for ashes found in Buchenwald um, we've we've actually actually found a couple of different kinds of crematoria markers in our collection, and the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum has several. Museums in Europe have several. Um, this one has an individual name and date, and and was ostensibly to identify an individual person's ashes in Weimar, which is where Buchenwald is. So it was found by a GI in Buchenwald. Um, and just as a way of sharing with you, this is the crematoria, the reconstructed crematoria in Buchenwald. For a completely different kind of artifact that you might be surprised to know we have in our collection, we actually have a wedding dress. Um, this is Herda Traub on her uh, wedding day. And she was a refugee and she actually managed to smuggle her wedding dress out and her family donated it to us. 
Um, and I wanted to show it to you because first of all, it's beautiful. And second of all, it's something that I certainly wouldn't have expected to have in the collection. And I'm really honored to have it because of course we know, uh, you know, heirloom wedding dress, especially something that was smuggled out as a refugee escaping Nazi Germany is so meaningful. Okay, in a completely different area, we actually have a collection of KKK history. Um, Dallas, unfortunately, was a, a center of KKK activity, especially at saw its height in the 1920s. I wanted to show you a very close up image of an identification card for a KKK member. Um, and just to read to you what it says here, because I honestly, until I was preparing for this lecture, hadn't read this word for word. And it is a little bizarre, so I want to share with you. So the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, this certifies that the bearer, W.D. Edmonston, whose signature appears on the reverse side hereof, has been found loyal and worthy of advancement in the mysteries of clan craft and has been passed to K-Duo, or Knight's Camellia, and is entitled to the rights and privileges thereof. The certificate also entitles the bearer to all rights and privileges of a clansman of K-Uno. In witness thereof, I have here and to affix my signature, blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, there's a lot of um, kind of pageantry and mystery all embodied in this one small artifact. This artifact is the size of a business card. Um, it's currently on display in our special exhibition at the museum on the, hit, on the fight for civil rights in the South. Um, but the, this idea of mystery, hidden, you know, loyalty, it, it struck me as very bizarre and telling. Um, and then another really fascinating artifact that came in with the same collection, um, you know, the history of KKK activity in Dallas in the 1920s, the KKK was an active political party and people were openly members and supporting of the KKK. And for many public officials, it was seen as a way to ensure you got votes. Um, and lock down your popularity. Uh, to the extent that there was a Klan Day at the State Fair of Texas in um, 1923, and this is a program for the Klan Day. There's speakers, there's special um, activities. Uh, you can get sworn in as a new member of the KKK. Um, and fascinating to us, at least, it had a list of uh, very honorable speakers and then a list of surprising sponsors right here. Pretty interesting stuff. Then just to change tax entirely, I wanted to share something about kind of what goes on behind the scenes at the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights as Museum as we've expanded our focus. We do a lot of collecting now in human rights, so we collect a lot of oral history testimonies. Until the until 2018, we were a Holocaust museum which means that we were collecting really 1933 to 1945, artifacts that really were from the 1930s and 40s, maybe a few years below, I mean, before and a few years after. Um, but that means, you know, almost everything was a black and white photograph, a letter on poor quality paper, maybe some news clippings. Um, but it really, uh, that material was very defined and was, kind of quintessential first half of the 20th century. As we've expanded our focus to include human rights, the kinds of materials we're collecting have changed a huge amount. And I just wanted to share for those of you who are interested, we're of course collecting oral history testimonies for Holocaust survivors, but also survivors of human rights abuses and people who have experienced the fight for civil and human rights in the United States. Um, but then we also have expanded to include collecting new types of material. So as an example, we have cell phone footage. If those of you who remember the Dallas shooting where five police officers were shot in 2016, um, we have cell phone footage of that shooting. Um, cell phone photos taken in a refugee camp showing the conditions there in Burundi and Rwanda. 
all kinds of different kinds of formats and content than we had previously collected. So those offer new challenges and new opportunities to us as well. Um, one example here, this is a cell phone photo of um, two of uh, Major and Bo. They um, fought for the right to get married and were arrested protesting protesting being de denied the right to get married. And here's a photo from that protest and when they eventually got married. Now a few example items, just one-off items that I thought you might find interesting. This artifact is pretty fascinating. This is a walking stick uh, made of agarita root. It was found in a tunnel underneath an internment camp. So an internment camp called the Poston Internment Camp or the Colorado River Location Relocation Center. And this is an example of, I didn't know anything about it until we got this artifact and looked into it, but the Colorado River Relocation Center at one time had 17,000 internees, basically in the desert in Arizona. Um, and so when you think in terms of finding this artifact in a tunnel, people actually dug tunnels and lived underground to have some access to cool, to a cool, comfortable space to be. And this was very carefully crafted um, out of a root and then was found later by an individual who's cleaning out that internment camp. So pretty interesting stuff. Um, the root has been polished and carefully crafted, but interestingly enough, the donor's family used it as a walking stick for decades after it was found. And it actually incurs some damage to the, the bottom part of it is broken. And I wanted to take a moment to talk about this artifact for a couple of reasons. Helmut Wolf was a refugee, a German Jewish refugee who settled in Dallas and was an integral part of the community here for, for I guess maybe 70, 75 years. Um, and, and we worked with him quite a bit at the museum and he passed away recently. Um, and so we wanted to remember him and share with you that he donated this beautiful, really architecturally crafted radio from 1933. This was a German radio that his family brought with them when they immigrated. Um, and I think it's interesting. It makes me think about access to information uh, about the how much we prize our personal possessions that mean a lot to us um, obviously his family made the effort to bring this this thing is large and it is heavy and they put a lot of effort into bringing it with them and keeping it safe all those years and so i thought that was kind of interesting uh, we all i think have items in our home that we pass down generation to generation that have meaning for us. Um, in my family, my grandmother makes little Christmas ornaments out of hollowed out eggshells, which is incredible and to my clumsy hands makes no sense, um, but she does beautiful work with that and her mother did it too and it's something that's passed down. Um, and this similarly is something that was prized in a family possession for a satyr. So this is a pre-war, so pre-World War II Austro-Hungarian Seder plate. Um, it has a little knit curtain to hide the matzo behind. It has a little set of dishes for all the um, Seder um, elements. Uh, it's a little banged up, but we're so glad that the donor decided to share it with us. It's, a, it's on display in the, in the museum's library. And this artifact, uh, we at the museum do not collect art as a general rule. We're a history museum. It's hard to use to teach our audience about the history of the Holocaust. Um, and the only time we make an exception is if that artwork is made by a survivor. And so we had a donor contact us. She had purchased this art piece of art in Tel Aviv from a survivor of Raven's book. And she told us that the survivor told her that the, the imagery, and this is a three-dimensional piece, so it has depth. It's almost like a shadow box, and the figures are 
fashioned out of clay and perched on wooden ledges inside this large shadow box. Um, and so the donor said that the artist told her that this piece of art was meant to symbolize the stratification of camp life and then the hollowness that the inmates felt from hunger. And it's really beautiful and striking. Okay, so I, uh, I, got, I went a little faster than I anticipated, but I think that means we have extra time for questions. Let me see here. Did we get any questions in the chat? Let me see here. We did. Okay. Were these US leaflets dropped by air over Germany? Yes, some of them were. Some of them were collected um, by the donor through his work as a Ritchie boy in counterintelligence, but the, the intention was to drop them um, during the campaign in Germany. And then I saw that there was someone with a raised hand. I'm not sure if, they, if, if you're able to type your question in the Q&A, then we would be able to see it. Felicia, um, you're, you're still sharing your... Um, oh, I'm sorry. My screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, is that better? Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, we just got a question from Deborah Polsky uh, with the um, Dallas Jewish Historical Society, and she would like to know what the museum's collection policy is. Okay, great question. So um, our collection development policy is four pages long, but I'll see if I could summarize it. Essentially, when it comes to Holocaust-related artifacts, we collect pre- and post-war, and then, of course, 1933 to 1945, artifacts and photos, letters, et cetera, relating to both liberators and refugees, kinder transportees, and victims and survivors of the Holocaust and their families. Um, and then for human rights, we collect um, human rights artifacts that relate to our 12 strands of um, human rights that are depicted in the museum. So we're talking local context, United States focus, civil rights, women's rights, children's rights, etc. So it has to somehow support our ability to tell our audience about the fight for human rights in the United States context and relate somehow to our, our core exhibition. Does that get it, Sarah? <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, there's, there's some, the, the, the one other thing that I would add, uh, Deborah, is we do a little bit of, of Judaica um, uh, collection, very, very little, but it's things that would be useful in illustrating either pre-war European Jewish culture, wartime European Jewish culture, um, you know, so, so things that would enable us to supplement um, special exhibits that we would be bringing in. So, so again, it, it has a very, a very particular uh, purpose to it. Um, Felicia, we had a question. Um, uh, this person would like to know if you could talk about the challenges relating to collecting anti-Semitica, so uh, anti-Semitic propaganda more generally, and other uh, Nazi artifacts. Well, you know, <sighs> Well, I'll talk about the Nazi stuff first, and then we can talk about the anti-Semitic stuff. <laughs> um, I would say that right now, and certainly I think throughout the five years I've been with the museum, uh, calls from families of GIs about Nazi paraphernalia they found in their grandparents' or parents' collections at home is the number one call I get. And there are 26 Holocaust museums and institutions in the United States, and we were really the only ones still accepting those donations. So the calls were constant and are constant. And we are in a position now that we are only accepting Nazi related uh, material that is unique. So what that means is you call me, you say, I found a Nazi flag in grandpa's desk drawer, 
and I have to evaluate to see if it's a unique flag or if it's one similar or exactly like a window banner that, ha that has been donated several times before to the museum. Um, same thing when it comes to Nazi pins, medals, weapons. The fact of the matter is GIs collected this stuff vigorously. They had a hierarchy of goal items they were looking for as a badge of honor. And, it, and it's kind of funny, I almost included it in my talk tonight and I just didn't get it done, but there's a form that we've located in one of our collections, you know, it was against the law to collect this stuff um, from the battlefield. Um, but there was an active underground black market for it. There was all kinds of ways people were getting a hold of it. Often GIs were exchanging food, cigarettes, chocolate with the pop population to get this stuff. Um, and the Germans were only too eager to make those exchanges. So it was happening. And so when we actually found a form, a, United, a US Army form where you could, you're invited to declare the Nazi paraphernalia you were bringing back with you. <laughs> so it was against the rules, but there was a form for it, which means it was tacit approval that we all know, we all know, that we all know is happening. Um, that being said, for us as a Holocaust museum, there's a limit to how much of this stuff we can display and use for education purposes. So we're not gonna collect duplicate items anymore. Um, and then for anti-Semitic materials, that really, is tough because for anything that shows bias, hatred, prejudice, anti-Semitism, often donors are reticent about admitting they have it um, or concerned that their character would be impugned if they were known to have collected this or purchased it or been a fan of it, you name it. So we see that when it comes to racist material too, you know, there's materials that have been donated to us where the donor was embarrassed that they had it because it was from another time and another family in their past and they weren't really comfortable with it, but they realized that it had a story to tell that had meaning for the museum. So it really comes down to a relationship with the donor, letting them know that we are trustworthy with that material culture and that we have a nuanced understanding of it. And then we go from there. Does that get it? Yeah, but there's also the, I, I'm just remembering some of the calls we got when uh, Felicia, when Felicia had one of her, her children. And so, so I had the, the pleasure of appreciating so much more what she does on a daily basis because I was fielding a lot of these archival calls and you would get people who sounded around my age, so, you know, middle age, and you, and they would whisper on the phone and they would say, you know, have I reached the museum? And I'd say, yes. And then they would say, um, I think my grandfather was a Nazi. You know, and my first, my first, I always wanted to say, why are we whispering? But I would always start the conversation by saying, why do you think that? And they'd say, you know, granddad, granddad passed recently and I found a trunk in the attic. It, or in the garage and the trunk was full of Nazi flags and, and you know, and they start to enumerate. And you know, the next question is always, was granddad a GI during World War II? And the answer invariably is why yes. And then I say, well, I, you know, I think I can probably pretty safely tell you that granddad was not a Nazi. He was an American soldier who brought home anything that wasn't nailed down. Um, and that's, you know, getting back to what Felicia was talking about, that's why there's so many of these types of things floating around out there. Um, uh, American GIs to this day bring back anything that isn't nailed down if nobody's watching them when they go into, when they go into a, a war zone. I mean, it's, it's the nature, and it's not just American GIs, it's the nature of troops. They're young. Um, these things are conversation pieces. It is... Uh, uh, flouting the rules, and that's an exciting thing when you're in a in you know in a military where everything is rule bound, and and so so this kind of thing happens. Well, and I think you know it makes sense in the sense of hey, this is proving I was there. Uh, when when I think about World War II, and I think about the experiences of these guys who maybe never left their county or certainly their home state, and all of a sudden they're in the middle of of Nazi Germany, there's a real sense of. I've done something different and special and interesting, and I want to prove I was there. Now, that feeling, I think, probably receded for most GIs as they came back and restarted their lives in the United States and 
left their worst experiences behind in some ways, but for others, it became an obsession. Um, so you do see these guys who collect, you know, trophies of war when they're in the theater and then become very, very obsessed with continuing to collect items um, related to this. Now, a lot of times that collecting turns into a really fruitful collection that a, a family member or the donor themselves, the collector themselves donates to the museum and tells us a lot. Like Rudy Baum's collection, I showed you four leaflets out of 300 and it shows a huge width, breadth of propaganda activity from, from all sides and it's really informative and we've loaned some of that collection out to other museums and it's been really impactful. So his kind of obsession, if you will, um, helped inform us as people trying to share this history with our audience. Um, and, and I'll just say too, I, I think a lot of what we do as archivists is try to help donors understand whether the items have a place in a museum and if not, we try to help them find a good place for it. Because if someone makes a call to us, most of the time they have good intentions. And even if it's not a good fit for our collection, we try to help them find the right place for it. Alicia, we have another question. Um, somebody okay. wants to know uh, if you could, if you know anything else about the recycled Nazi uh, flag item. So I guess the pillowcase and the, the, the lovely red handkerchief with the embroidery. Um, do you know who made them or or how we came to have them in our collection? Great question. Um, anticipating that question, I looked it up and read the donor file. And I'm, I'm afraid all I can share with you is that the collection has, I showed you two examples, it has about a dozen fabric pieces in it. Um, so essentially, if you think of a large window banner that's been cut up and repurposed, so it has several pillowcases, a full set of hankies or napkins, I'm not sure which. Um, that seems pretty ornate for a hanky to me, but you know, different strokes for different folks, I guess. Um, and the person put a lot of time and effort into making these. I unfortunately don't know anything about the maker of those items or how the donor got to have them. So the donor file is pretty, um, and you know, I think I have had the experience personally several times. This collection came in before I started working at the museum, so I don't, I didn't have a personal relationship with the donor. But when you have a donor file that doesn't have a lot of content, often the donor is embarrassed they don't know anything else about it. Especially if, you know, you know, grandson goes to clean out granddad's house, didn't have maybe the most fruitful uh, connection with granddad, didn't know about his war experience, and is embarrassed to find this and to realize he didn't know this whole aspect of his grandfather's life. And that can, that same story can play out in all kinds of different ways. Okay. Um, Felicia, Marsha Gasworth uh, would like to know Marcia. if you can see these artifacts in the permanent collection uh, and how you would go about doing that. Oh, so if you want to see them in living color in person. Okay. So we have a reading room and all you have to do is make an appointment with me. So if there's a subject area or a collection that you're interested in looking at, we would be happy to work with you. Of course, we have some social distancing needs that we would just spread out and show you the collections. And all we need to know is an appointment and we'll pull out what you want to look at. And our collection is meant to be used and looked at. We're always thinking down the line of you know, supplementing our core exhibit or special exhibits with these artifacts, but also making them available for researchers. And, and just so you all know, we do get researchers. We've helped several people with books. We've helped other museums populate their collections and their exhibits. So we're, we're up and running. Okay. Um, Marsha was also asking uh, whether uh, we've um, uh, contacted the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission uh, about them having liberators dono donate um, uh, artifacts to us. And Marsha, as far as that goes, that's not part of their uh, liberator project. Their liberator project is an oral history testimony project. And in fact, we have shared some of our collected oral history testimonies from liberators with the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission. Uh, and we have 
a collection. It's not huge, but we do have a collection of some liberator uh, artifacts that have been donated to us over the years from local liberators uh, while they were still uh, with us um, from our region. So we have things that, that come from as far away as Texarkana, actually. Uh, we have uh, a collection uh, from a gentleman named uh, Richard Kramer, um, and, and uh, Felicia didn't share this tonight, but it's 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 an interesting um, package which we use to supplement an exhibit, as we were talking uh, about earlier with Deborah Polsky. He, Richard Kramer, was a photography student uh, at a technical college in New York City who was drafted, but he was drafted as a medical corpsman. Uh, and the army trained him to be a medical corpsman. He had no experience as such, but he grabbed his camera from his classes and went overseas with it. He ended up at Buchenwald just a few days after the liberation. So he isn't technically a liberator. He was there maybe four or five days after Buchenwald was, was liberated, but he was there very, very early on. And he took a packet of photographs of piles of bodies, of, of gallows there for, for hanging uh, some of the, the, the Nazi officials that they caught there, of other things, while his medical unit was doing triage to sort the typhus patients away from those patients who weren't suffering from the disease so that they could move them out and quarantine them. He then developed these photos into packets for American GIs at a small cost to take home with them to show the folks at home what they were doing. And he developed these photos in a van that he and a couple of his buddies in the medical unit liberated. Um, it's a different kind of a liberation. Um, and they uh, painted a sign on the side of their van that said, Toot Sweet Photography. Um, and he also Sarah, donated- if you want, I can share that image right now. Oh, that would be awesome. Uh, um, and he also, uh, as part of his collection, um, took a lot of photos of, of Mademoiselles in Paris when he went on leave. Um, frequently in what at the time in 1945 they would have been considered racy photos today you have so they were you know in their their un undergarments today women wear less walking down the street at the beach um but but at the time they were very very racy so we have this collection oh wonderful there it is so uh, you know i'm glad you brought that up sarah well i want to make a plug the next artifact based program on offer is on September 9th and it's all about our Liberator collection. Um, so this is an image of Rick Kramer in front of the van where they were developing these images and it's a little bit faded but I, the guys look pretty jolly so it's a good a good photo. I mean just I think the oh yeah he also has some the collection has some really interesting three-dimensional objects so he was working as a as a medic and and testing people so here's a microscope from the collection and then i included this and this is this is in preparation for the liberator lunch and learn on september 9th but this is a little um german camera that he purchased and it made me think of little brownies because when people real you know it, it's hard to imagine but gis were taking hundreds of photographs hundreds and so your average guy in the army, whether in the Pacific or the European theater was taking hundreds of photographs using basically inexpensive handheld cameras. And the only real challenge to these guys was getting film uh, because film was hard to produce using chemical processes that were in demand for warfare purposes. And so it's just interesting when we get collections, sometimes we get so many photos, we don't even know how to deal with it. And you wouldn't necessarily think 100% that these guys were able to take that, meant that much photography during the war, but they were. Pretty cool collection, so you'll see some more of it. And Marsha, in answer to your question, he became a Texas, a Texas liberator because he ultimately settled in Texarkana. Uh, and that's where he passed away, I believe in 2010. And that's where his son, who donated this collection to us, um, lives to this day. So, so there is now this direct uh, Texas connection. Um, and, and be careful if you're speaking to Texarkana High School students. 
<laughs> if you're from Arkansas and you tell them, oh, I love Texarkana, Arkansas, 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 and they say, oh, no, 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 we're from the Texarkana, Texas side. Like, we're the good side, not the Arkansas side. And I'm like, well, I think the Arkansas side is the good side. So I got in trouble with some high school students that way. <laughs> okay. Um, I think that, oh, no, there was one other thing I wanted to add. Um, when you were talking about Rudy Baum, uh, and you were talking about his being a Richie boy, uh, but you failed to mention why Richie. Uh, <laughs> oh, because of Camp Richie. Well. Yeah. yeah. So uh, they were stationed, all of these, these boys, um, these were, you know, people from, uh, young men from the ages of 18 to about 22. They were trained uh, at Camp Ritchie, Maryland, which is uh, outside of Frederick, Maryland. And so that's why they were called the Ritchie Boys. They were a small part of a much larger intelligence and counterintelligence installation there. Theirs was a, a German um, language and, and Russian uh, and French and Czech specialized program, but mostly German where they were gonna be dropped into uh, the, the field with American fighting units so that they could interrogate high value targets in the field. But there was also a Japanese uh, cryptology uh, unit that was stationed there, which was all Japanese, Japanese American women, as a matter of fact. And then there were a whole bunch of American GIs who were not Japanese because we didn't trust the Japanese at this time to go into the Pacific theater, who were trained to go into the Pacific theater as translators and they they were all um uh anglo uh in in uh in ethnicity so 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 fort ritchie was a, was an interesting place um spencer are you gonna take us out tonight or are we taking ourselves out sure i can do that thank you all so much for joining us we really appreciate it another big thank you to our community partners um, for helping support this program your support again means the absolute world to us um, Please tune in again for more of our programs. Like Felicia said, we have another Lunch and Learn featuring Artifacts on Liberation coming up September 9th, I believe, um, in the afternoon. Um, but to find out more about our upcoming programs and events, please do check out our website, dhhrm.org. Um, and with that, we wish you a safe and healthy rest of your evening. Take care. Good night, everybody.